If you have your Bibles, open them to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. This is a quick little thing that I just wanted to bring up because I think it is important. Um, it maybe helps, helps correct the way, that we, the way that we think about things. Paul essentially says, be imitators of myself as I am an imitator of Christ. You know, sometimes I think we think in terms of, and it's not wrong, um, that, that we are ultimately to pattern our lives after Jesus, right? That's the goal. That's the end goal. He's the pattern. He's the blueprint. He, he became flesh. He lived the perfect life. So when we look at the way we live, Jesus is who we look at. There is a slight problem, though, for us in that Jesus is not in the flesh with us now. Right? He sent his spirit to us. And this demonstrates a practice of the early church that I think is good, which is that in the, in the bounds of discipleship, when you are in a relationship with someone who is older in the faith, not necessarily older, but older in the faith that you are being mentored or discipled by, um, it is not wrong to think of them as a model for how to do some of the things that you do if they are imitating Christ, right? That's the goal. And so if it's not that you just pick someone and imitate them that's in the church, but you find someone who's mature in the faith that can walk with you and show you and live out these things in a way that's helpful for you to pattern your own life uh, alongside them. And I think that sometimes scares us a little bit of like, well, I don't want to imitate that person. I want to imitate Jesus. I agree. But Paul is using this practice in a very practical manner to say there's nothing wrong with looking at leaders, believers who are mature, and asking the question, how did they do this? Now, this is assuming that, like Paul, these people are humble, right? That they, you, you don't want to find someone who will tell you to be an imitator of themselves because they have it all right. Because they almost certainly, at that point, don't have it all right. <laughs> Um, you want to find someone who's willing to say, you know what, I may not always get it, get it right, but I'll show you how to respond when I get it wrong. There's, there's actually a lot of value in learning how to repent uh, by seeing someone else do it. It's a very practical uh, experience that is, is actually very beneficial. So just a, a side thing there that may not be that surprising to you. Hopefully, maybe for some of you it is. It is a, an early practice that Paul adopts, and I think it's, I think it's helpful. Um, let's look at the Lord's Supper for a moment. This is how Paul addresses the Lord's Supper in Corinthians. Now, remember, we already talked about this in Matthew and in Luke, and how Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, was drawing upon Old Testament imagery to drive deeper the reality of what it was he was really doing. He's not just having a supper where we remember him. that We are doing that. But he is initiating a covenant that he is making with his people, and it is based on covenant practices from Exodus, Leviticus, and other parts of the Old Testament, specifically the Torah. Here, uh, the, the Lord's Supper has been instituted. This is a church. It's a full-functioning church. Um, they, have, they have hierarchies and leadership. Um, they have the ordinances being practiced. They're just doing them wrong. And Paul is going to address it. Look at verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the pl first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, one gets drunk. What? I love that. <laughs> do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. I love that. Just very matter of fact. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after, say, or after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's mimicking Luke's language, not Matthew's. Uh, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, 
And then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now check this out. This is what he says next, because this is shocking. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let them eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the things other, I will give directions when I come. Now, there are a few things, I think, that need to be mentioned up front about this practice. One is that this is not the practice of singing songs, eating wafers, and drinking juice. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with this necessarily because we're not commanded on how to participate in the Lord's Supper. We're never told, like, make fish and unleavened bread and all these things. These are practices from a Jewish community, but they're not specifically commanded in this context. However, I will say this, that I think that this does lend tremendous credence to a practice that most of Christianity uh, is not probably privy to, and that is celebrating a Passover meal once a year, because that's what was happening here. This was the Passover, right? Uh, it's what it was based off of, at least. And so um, whether they were doing it only on the Passover, it sounds like it was happening more than that. It was modeled after that meal, and it was a meal. They were coming, and they were eating, and they were drinking together in remembrance of Jesus. Now, it was not a meal to satisfy hunger. So that, that, that lends us to believe that there was probably not like, you know, especially not Texas-sized servings. Um, uh, it would not have been like a full meal in that category. It, that's why he says, if you're hungry, eat at home first. Make sure you're not doing this for, hung it's not for hunger. And that was what was happening, is that there were some people who were poor. They did not have the means to eat and drink uh, regularly. They were showing up. The wealthy who had plenty of food at home were still coming, and they were eating all the food, and the poor people were showing up, and there was none left for them. <laughs> and it was just a mat, and they're taking the wine, and they're abusing it unto drunkenness when it was never meant for that. Drunkenness is clearly a sin in the New Testament. They were making a mockery of the Lord's table. And Paul says, this is why many of you are sick and some have died, because judgment has come upon you in the way that you have treated this. This is shocking. This is shocking stuff. I mean, imagine like a, an apostle, you know, coming to the church and saying like, yeah, you know how a lot of y'all are sick and, and, and have some have died? It's because you're doing this wrong and God's not pleased with it. We would be like, oh, right. So this is a, a really serious offense. Now he says, um, let a person examine himself, right? Discern the body. Um, one of the ways that we interpret this is that when you come to the Lord's Supper, and we're going to have a night of worship, hopefully here pretty quickly, Kelsey's planning one out, um, that when you come to the Lord's Supper at night of worship, that you examine yourself before you take the supper. If there is sin, unresolved sin, it doesn't even necessarily have to be sin that you've committed. If there's just some relational devastation that has happened, that has unsettled you, it may not be a, an appropriate time for you to take the supper. If your spirit is not, if you, if you examine yourself and you're like, you know what, I don't know that I really need to do this. And, and I think there's a lot of like shame that comes along with that for, for believers that feel like, you know, I'm in a public setting, I'm with other Christians, and if I abstain, then people are going to think like, oh, I wonder what's going on in his life, right? It's actually an act of maturity, of Christian maturity. There's no shame in that. When I see someone abstaining from the Lord's Supper, I feel a tremendous amount of respect towards that person because they have done what the scriptures have commanded. And there are going to be other times that we take the supper, and we're not taking the supper as some means of grace, as some of the Catholic and, and hyper-reformed churches will, uh, will uh, say. I'm not saying that this is a matter of examining oneself to find out if you're, like, guilt-free. You're not guilt-free. Spoiler alert, right? Whether you think it or not. This has to do with examining whether your spirit is, is right. You know how there are days when there are things that have happened and you're just not right? Like you're just not, things are just not like you're quick to anger, you're irritable, you've got like a, a heaviness to you because of something that's going on. And you're like, you know what? I, like 
I think it's safe to say in that time, it's, it may not be the best time for you to drink. Because the idea here is that you are taking these elements in remembrance of the sacrifice made for you. And when you come to the Lord's table in that condition, you are distracted. You, you have this other thing pulling at you. And you're never to come and just it be sort of this like one part of your attention. And so there are times I think it is very appropriate to abstain. And, and actually, once again, an act of, of maturity. Okay, <clears throat> spiritual gifts. Here we go. Put your thinking caps on. Um, I have on your handout 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. I, I don't have any verses that I have highlighted here because there are just a lot of them. And I feel like if we are, <clears throat> we are going to cover them, but to put them all on a paper, it would, take, it would just take a lot of paper. So 12 through 14. Uh, I'll be mentioning, referencing these, so if you want to write them down or highlight them, then that's fine as well. But we're going to talk through the spiritual gifts, and namely, the ones that I think cause the most confusion. So, like, knowledge, wisdom, faith, y'all are like, I know what that is, mostly, right? Um, I, I don't, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the ones that I think are going to be really advantageous for us to discuss. Look at... 12, 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by one spirit. And another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, an interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, this first and foremost is not an exhaustive list of the spiritual gifts. I know that because there are other lists in the New Testament and they include things that are not in this one. There are some things in this one that are not included in the other lists. So it's important for us first to understand that Paul is not giving us the comprehensive view of the spiritual gifts. He is writing these things for a purpose to address what's happening in Corinth, okay? Um, and he lists several of them here uh, to one the utterance of wisdom, the other, the utterance of knowledge, these are teaching faculties, um, the utterance of faith, this is not the kind of faith that brought all of you into a relationship with Jesus, this is a spiritual gift of faith that is much greater than just the faith enacted by every Christian, okay? Um, so, in other words, not everyone has these gifts, and I'll, I will prove that at least in part for some of these in, in our talk tonight. Um, but let me say that up front. Not everyone has all the gifts. In fact, oftentimes it is one or maybe two gifts that a believer has. You remember we talked about in Romans the body of Christ being made up of members. And each member serves as a function. Well, this is the, I, the imagery that's used with regard to spiritual gifts. Some of you have gifts of wisdom, some of knowledge, some of faith, so on and so forth. And when those gifts come together in the context of the body, the body is edified. So that's the first thing that you need to understand is that in, in this context, and in really all the contexts where Paul is giving a list of spiritual gifts, it is first for the edification of the church. Okay? Edification. The building up to edify. Something that is positive. Something that builds up the church. So let's talk about the more miraculous ones, because I think these are the ones that probably, um, probably trip us up the most. And we'll begin with tongues, because I think it's probably the one that is on the forefront of each of your minds, although prophecy may be as well. We'll talk about that afterwards. I want to start with a precursor to help us understand where tongues fits 
into the context of redemption history. So in the beginning, when God creates everything, there is one language. There's only one language. And man and woman have fellowship with God. They walk with God. They talk with God. Um, Genesis chapter 3 happens. And Satan, through the serpent, right, um, comes and tempts Eve and Adam, and sin happens. Sin occurs in creation, in mankind. Um, things get rather bad, rather fast. And if you're in the Sunday morning Bible study, we just studied Noah. I or no, we're studying Noah this week. Um, God floods the world and kills every bit of flesh except for those who are on the ark, which is Noah, his three sons, their wives, and a bunch of animals. But not like millions of animals, just to be clear. Read the study if, if you don't agree. Um, as a result, there's sort of a reset that happens in creation. Noah becomes almost like the second Adam. In fact, it's actually interesting. In, in, uh, in chapter 9, when Noah comes off the ark, it says Noah became a man of the soil, became a man of the ground. Um, ground in Hebrew is the word Adama, from which we get Adam. There's actually a play on words in Genesis 1, that Adam is made from our Genesis 2, that Adam comes from the soil, God makes him from the soil, so he's a man of the ground. Noah becomes a man of the ground. Now, he doesn't mean that he is created in the same way as Adam. It means that he begins tending the ground, as man was commanded to do, and he sets up a vineyard. Um, of course, from his line, which is the line of Seth, which is the righteous, more righteous line than Cain, um, the world becomes populated through his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, the world, once again, becomes a bad place, because even though they're a righteous line with hope, there's still sin. And so people are bad. People rebel. So we get to chapter 11, and things have gotten so bad that man is unified against God such that they desire to build a tower to reach into the heavens. There's great, uh, there's great wordplay in the Hebrew. It says that the tower reaches up into the heavens. It describes it as this grand and majestic tower. And it says that God stoops over and bends down to look at it. It's that tiny to God. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, as a result of their sin and rebellion and their unification in sin, he confuses their languages. And, and this is a judgment on mankind for their rebellion. It also gives us, who are not in uh, that time, an idea of why there are so many languages. It's one of the questions that Moses' people likely had. Why are there so many languages? If there was only one in the beginning, how did this all happen? Genesis 11 explains that. Now, we get to chapter 12, and God calls a man by the name of Abram, who is from Shem's line. So Shem is once again this line that provides hope for humanity. Abram comes forth, and God tells Abram in chapter 12, verse 2, that I will make of you a great nation. Now we learn as we read that that is ultimately Israel. Through his line, Isaac and then Jacob, Jacob becomes Israel. Israel's function as God's people is many, but one of their functions was to reach the world to be, um, what's the word, not evangelical, although that's probably a fine word, to proselytize. And it was a practice that was adopted even in Jesus' time. The Pharisees proselytized as they were gathering followers. Um, the problem is, is that they were one nation who was supposed to reach the world, and the way they reached the world was by saying, leave your nation and join us. Now, the obvious problem here is there is a language barrier. And so, apart from, um, once again, a myriad of other things, these are kind of an oversimplification, um, they didn't do too well in reaching the world. And so, you skip past that point. There's, that's the issue. There's one language within one people group, and, and this stands as a boundary for God reaching them. Um, we know that after the New Testament era, if we just sort of skip over the New Testament for a moment, we know that we will once again be reunited in one language. 
Revelation 7, 9 and 10, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches within, uh, within their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, one singular voice. So there is an idea of unity, once again, in the new heavens and the new earth, we, we will no longer have this confusion, this barrier of languages that was a result of our rebellion because rebellion is snuffed out in the new heavens and the new earth. So in the beginning and in the end, we have one language. But then 11 through that point, we have multiple languages and it stands as a barrier, which brings us to the New Testament. Jesus dies. He is raised on the third day, conquering sin and death. He ascends to the right hand of the Father in Acts 1. The Spirit comes in Acts 2, just like He said would happen. And then what happens? The Spirit overcomes the barrier of languages for the first time to not tell people to come in and adopt our ways, but that we'll meet you where you are. The church then is boundaryless with regard to national identity. All tribes, all nations, all Gentiles are invited. They're grafted in, as Paul says in Romans. So this is the first symbol, really, in the New Testament that God is doing something to undo Babel, <clears throat> to undo the confusion and to reunite people in Christ. It's a really cool picture. It's a really cool symbol. Now, in that passage in Acts 2, they are speaking to the men, and they are from multiple places, multiple nations. It's during the Passover. They've come to Jerusalem to take the Passover, and that's the whole point of that passage. Is that it says that they are amazed that they were hearing the message in their own dialect, their own language, dialectos. But there were some that didn't. They just thought that like they were drunk or something. And they're like, it's not even noon, and they're gibberish. There's just they don't understand. So something was going on. Some were understanding. Some were not. But the ones that were understanding were hearing it in their own dialect. So this was not probably a, an actual usage of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, because it is not a language, it is a hearing that is happening. They are understanding or interpreting. Perhaps it was the, the spiritual gift of languages, and it was a language that through the Spirit could be interpreted in several dialects. We don't know. We're not really told. But what I want to submit to you is that Acts 2, and even a couple of other places in Acts, is likely not the best pattern of understanding what is going on in 1 Corinthians, and there's a few reasons for why. Um, let me give you my definition of speaking in tongues for tonight, and I think it will help maybe solve some of this. Speaking in tongues is either a message or a prayer spoken in syllables not understood by the speaker and the vast majority of listeners. And I say vast majority of listeners because Paul indicates that there has to be an interpreter who likely understands and can interpret. There are instances when there's not an interpreter, and as we're going to find out, it shouldn't be done then because of the point of what this is for. Tongues um, is honestly a little bit of an unfortunate translation, I think, in our, in our Bibles. The word for tongues is the word glossa, which is literally the word for tongue, but it is used overwhelmingly to mean language, okay? So we say speaking in tongues, that sounds weird, it sounds foreign, it sounds crazy. Um, if it were translated speaking in languages, it would feel like, okay, that's not as weird, right? And that is literally how it is read, is just speaking in languages. Um, now, what is the context of 1 Corinthians 14? The context of 1 Corinthians 14 is the church gathering and how the gifts are used for the building up, once again, and edification of the church. This is what he's talking about here. So this is not talking about something like on Pentecost when um, Peter gets up and begins speaking and all these people begin hearing and people come to faith. There are examples of this uh, in modern day missions that we hear of, missionaries on the field where crazy things happen and they are able to communicate somehow with people that they do not know the language with and they don't even oftentimes realize they're doing it. 
Uh, I've, I've heard numerous stories from extraordinarily conservative Bible-believing Christians who are not charismatic, who have said, like uh, Janelle Hanna, the Hanna family, they are, um, they are actually linguists, uh, interestingly enough, ironically. They are Bible translators in different parts of the world. And I think it was either Janelle or one of her friends that was like conversing with one of these people about Jesus. And afterwards, the person, the local was like, how did you learn the language so fast? And she was like, what do you mean? I was speaking in English. And he was like, no, you weren't. You were speaking in our dialect. Yeah. And she was like, mm, you know, so it does happen. I don't think that's what's being described here. Now, it is a gift of the Spirit, clearly, and it is a gift of languages, but it's a different function. So I want you to understand that the context of this is not evangelism. It is for the building up of the body. Let's talk through 14 of what this looks like, and I'll show you. I mean, we're just going to go through verse by verse, and um, you'll, you'll get, a, I think, a little bit of a picture of how this is to be used. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Paul says that for when one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. So in this first text, we learn that this gift was being practiced or was to be practiced in such a way that it was not directed to the people, but to God. So this indicates, uh, Paul, that this was a prayer, likely. This was talking to God. This was a, com a communication to God that other people were hearing. No one understood, not the speaker or the listeners. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 10 through 12. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you were zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. He says before that, uh, if you look back in, let's see here, where is that? Um, uh, verse 6, now brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Even before that, not, not, um, not now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. This is the purpose of the gift. Someone is there to interpret, and then the church understands what's being said. The speaker perhaps understands what's being said. And in that prayer, the church is built up through this practice. Uh, keep in mind that prayer then, when praying, is an act that is meant to be with both spirit and mind, okay? Um, there is an idea that through spiritual prayer or, or praying in tongues, that it's just sort of this ecstatic, you know, out of control. And by the way, this comes from what he was saying, um, the, the uh, African-American influence from when the unfortunate slave trade and the things that were brought from other cultures, other religions. But even actually prior to that, because this was obviously you know, 2,000 years before that, um, in Corinth, there were mystery, what we call mystery religions that were very present in their time. They believed in an ecstatic practice where you would gather, you would remove your mind and your control from your body, and through this sort of emotional uh, experience, you would allow the spirit to consume you and you would be lifted up into some spiritual realm where then you would communicate and commune with God. And it was in this heavenly language and the people watching you, you look like you're seizing and saying nonsense, but in reality, you are communing with God. Paul is speaking against that. This is not the kind of practice that is ever found in the New Testament. It is not an out-of-control out or out-of-body moment. And look what he says. And look at verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at the giving of thanks, since he doesn't know what you're saying? So Paul is teaching about prayer here a little bit. He's saying that when you bless, when you pray a blessing upon the church, the intended 
procedure is that the person prays the blessing and the church in understanding and hearing responds with amen to notify him, hey, we get it, amen, we agree, right? And Paul is making the case, how will they agree with what you're praying for if they don't know what you're praying for? They may not like what you're praying for. <laughs> and and I, by the way, this is just a, a practical side note. If, if you're ever at a conference or at another church um, that is different than, than, than your denomination, and I'm not, I, I think there's very honestly helpful benefits to being exposed to other ways of doing things, um, but there are times when you might be subjected to uh, a group prayer of sorts where there are things said that you don't necessarily agree with. And, and I've been in conferences before in groups where we are praying and I'll be, you know, someone will be praying and I'm like, yes, Lord, yes, mm, amen. No, Lord, I don't agree with that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, no, I, that's okay. That's all right. And Paul says, you, you amen if you agree and you understand what's being said. Uh, don't amen if you don't agree, all right? Um, just a side practical note there. But the idea here is that, look, when you pray in this way, your mind is unfruitful. Therefore, when you pray, pray with spirit and mind. Bless with spirit and mind. Sing with spirit and mind. Do, in other words, do the practice in a way you understand. He's really limiting this, this ecstatic practice at this point, which had become commonplace in the Corinth church uh, during this time. I think the bottom line is that the modern practice of tongues is done in a drastically unbiblical way the majority of the time. Uh, let, me, let me say this too, ecstatic utterances. So this is a, a term that many of you have likely heard. We use, we've used it tonight. Let me show you where that came from. It came from the New English Bible translation um, that translates speaking in tongues as ecstatic utterances. So there's not like an ecstatic utterances phrase in this context ever. Now, he is going to describe um, the idea that, like, well, once again, 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28, if you look there, he says, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only one or two, at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. He is designing order here in this practice. So it's never like one starts and then the dominoes fall and everyone's on the floor. He's like, no, at most three, really one or two is fine. And if there's an interpreter, great. If there's not, then keep your mouth shut. Now let me say this too, because there's, there's also talk of like a prayer language, right? A personal prayer language. And in here is my general problem with that understanding, is that the, once again, the context of these gifts is always the edification of the body. So it makes very little sense to me to read this in such a way that communicates that what Paul is saying is you use this gift with an interpreter for the edification of the body, and if there's no interpreter, then just do it on your own and you can be edified yourself. In fact, I would say that any time you are using your gift for your own self-edification and not the edification of others, you're abusing the gift. If, if I, so for example, people who are in teaching and preaching positions who utilize their giftedness to write lots of books and make lots of money and not really ever pour into other people, I have a real problem with. I have a real issue with that. People have asked me several times, you know, why don't you write a book? I don't have time because I'm, I would rather be doing this. This is how the gift's supposed to be used. This is, this is why I do this. Not all speak in tongues, okay? So if you go, if, you, if you're around people who are like, you got to speak in tongues for anything, they're wrong, they're, they're abusing the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 30, do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts? He's being facetious here. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 30. Yeah. The, the, the answer to that, he's speaking rhetorically, is resoundingly, no, all do not possess these gifts. And, and I mean, it's, it's, isn't it funny that that's the passage, right, that, that we pull from with all speaking in tongues, and yet do we believe in those churches that everyone can heal? Like, you're not really a Christian until you've healed someone. Is there anyone that's a Christian in this room then? No, probably not. I mean, I just, I, you know, I have a real hard time 
with, with that mentality, there are things I do not, so for what it's worth, and, and this is where we were going to end anyway, um, I do not ascribe that this is a gift that is even in still, still in practice anymore. And, and I have that belief based on history. So after the early church, and by early church, I really mean not even the first 300 years, I mean like about the first 100 years, the gift is virtually silent in all Christian writing. And in fact, by the third and fourth century, commentaries by the church fathers during that time admit that they're not even really sure how the gift worked because it was out of commission so long before their time. And that was in the two and 300 A.D., and all throughout Reformation history, medieval history, the patristics, everything in between, you have nothing regarding these gifts. And then something happens. I'll go on a soapbox a little bit. Um, something happens. You have the enlightenment that takes place. We become reinvigorated by learning. Um, it pushes us into modernity. And so in the, modern, the modern era, modernity... And, and, and what, yeah, exactly. So in like the 18th, 19th, really the 19th and, and early 20th century, you have the modern era. And the modernity is classified as the highest point of optimism in humanity. Like we were the most optimistic at this point. It was the rise of technology, the rise of industrialization, science was taking over, we were beginning to believe that with progress, we're going to have all the answers. We're going to be much better. We're not going to hate each other anymore. Why would we hate each other? We're all one common man in, in going after one common goal. I mean, what is there to lose? Modernity offers everything, and, and we're going to have all the answers, and we're going to be, it's going to, the world is going to be the best it's ever been. And then you know what crashed modernity to the floor? the worst two wars in human history, World War I and World War II. And after that, we enter into what we call postmodernism, postmodernity. And in postmodernism, I love this definition. Uh, a professor of mine read this to us. It is, and there, I'll explain it because there are some weird words. An incredulity toward meta-narrative. So, in other words, we are skeptical and we reject anything that claims to have a meta-narrative, an overarching story of, of unity. So the Bible and postmodern scholarship is not 66 books of, of divine inspiration. You know, Genesis, I mean, Genesis chapter one was, was likely written by one guy and Genesis chapter two was likely written by another and then three and four were written by someone else and then Isaiah one through 39 is, is one author and then it's not till second, uh, second temple Judaism that the last part of Isaiah is written. And so, you know, if that's the case, like we need to just take our Bibles and start ripping pages out of them because the Bible is not a unified book with a, a, a meta narrative of redemption it's just a conglomerate of a bunch of individual writings, some of which were sort of copy and pasted together, and they don't even have any of the same authorship. This is what postmodernism does. This is the kind of crap that we have to read in seminary to know what's wrong and what's right. And it's boring. <laughs> and it's wrong. So we get into postmodernism, but I say that to say that with the modern world, where optimism is at a great high, Everything becomes about experience. We want to experience. We're, we want to experience joy. And we want to feel great about the world that we live in. And it is no surprise to me that the Azusa Street Revival, uh, which was the birth of Pentecostalism in the early 20th century, uh, Seventh-day Adventism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, all of these these groups that claim a divine revelatory moment of experience that defines a religious practice occur in the hotbed of modern thought. There's no wonder that that was the case. Now, that's why postmodernism is so strongly in objection to most of the modern Christian practices. 
because they are all about experience and postmodernism is like, that's your experience, it's not my experience. Your truth is cool, my truth is my truth. Let bygones, you know, right? And, and so that's kind of the mindset of the modern world, maybe a little more than what you bargained for there. I think the point is, is that it's very hard to make a case that these gifts should be used in a church service today based purely on church history alone. Now that's not an end-all, be-all argument. I, I recognize that. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I would echo the early church fathers. I wouldn't even know how to begin to institute this. We have no idea how this worked. But we do know that it was working poorly in Corinth, and Paul was seeking to bring order back to an otherwise unorderly, chaotic situation. Now, to get at your question about Romans 8, 26 through 27, um, because that is one of the passages that often is sort of lumped into this whole discussion. Paul says, um, let's see here, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind is, or what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. That's where 28 begins. So, that was Romans 8, 26 and 27. Um, so for one, there's, there's nothing about tongues there, right? There's nothing about a speech. There's a groaning. There's other instances of groaning um, that take place both in the New and Old Testament, and they almost always refer to a sense of, um, uh, what's the word, I'm, suffering or burdensome, um, worry, uh, anxiety. I think the idea here, one of the ways that people have interpreted this, and, and I've been guilty of this in years past as well, is that um, it's the Spirit interceding for you when you don't understand what to pray, and so the Spirit's just sort of always interceding for you on your behalf. Now, for what it's worth, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. But the problem with that in this context is that this is something that the Spirit is helping us do, not doing for us. So I think the point here is that when you pray and you are grieved and you are burdened with something that has happened, you are in distress and you don't know what to pray and you are in angst about it, I think that the Spirit uses those moments and intercedes for us on our behalf, interprets those emotional outcries to God such that they have value and meaning, if that makes sense. Um, so it is sort of a communicative property, but it's not something that I think is happening with words, and it's not something that is to be interpreted for other people. This does seem like private prayer to me. Let's talk about prophecy for a minute. Prophecy is something that um, is often, once again, misunderstood. I want to give you a few definitions that I think are sometimes equated with prophecy, and then I'm going to tell you my definition, <clears throat> which I believe is right. So, um, it's actually not my definition, to be fair. I, uh, it's Wayne Grudem's. I really like his definition, and I didn't feel like changing it. So, <laughs> give Wayne Grudem credit where credit's due. Here are some of the things that we think of when we think of prophecy. We think of predicting the future. That's one right? Um, we think of proclaiming a word from the Lord, thus says the Lord, prophecy. Uh, we think of powerful preaching. Yes, right. Here is what I uh, agree with. I think this is good. Telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. I think that's an okay definition. Telling someone that God has uh, spontaneously brought to mind. Now, the first thing that we have to cover here for you to understand this is how prophecy is different than Old Testament prophets, and they are, okay? Um, because this is one of the things that you'll hear evangelicals rag on, and, it's, and it does somewhat echo uh, what you were saying, which is this kind of the stoning issue. Um, and I actually think that this is based on a misunderstanding. So Old Testament prophets, I am going to argue, are equivalent to New Testament apostles. Here's why. Old Testament prophets are able to speak and write words that have absolute divine authority. 
So they can say things like, thus says the Lord. And to disobey or disbelieve a prophet was to disobey or disbelieve God himself. It was a horrible offense. Prophets were that powerful. Deuteronomy 18, 19, whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, talking about a prophet, I myself will require it of him. So like he, he is, it is, it is crystal clear a prophet is to be listened to. He is a vessel for God's words, both in speech and sometimes in writing. Prophets in the Old Testament are able to perform miracles on demand. They are able to do things that demonstrate or authenticate that Yahweh is the one true God. Just read any of kings, uh, judges, of course, they're judges, they're not really prophets, but it's, you know, they, they act in a lot of ways like them. But kings, Elijah, Elisha, are able to do things that are crazy. Moses, I mean, Moses is the greatest prophet that ever lived up till Jesus. He's able to do a lot of really weird things. So, <clears throat> miracles on demand, voice of God, to disbelieve or disobey was to be in rebellion against God himself. Um, when we think about the New Testament apostles, they are able to speak and write words that had absolute divine authority. They were able to perform miracles on demand to authenticate the gospel through Jesus. They appeal to their apostleship, not the fact that they're prophets, whenever they are talking about their authority. So every one of them begin their letters, right? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He defends his apostleship, not the fact that he's a prophet. Paul was likely a prophet, but he was also an apostle which had incredible precedent over everything because he had ultimate authority. He had ultimate ability to tell people what to do, and it was a command. You do it. You do these things, which is why uh, Ephesians says that these things were built on the apostles and prophets. I'm talking about the Old Testament prophets at that point. So the New Testament apostles and the Old Testament prophets as the foundation for the church. So why... The change in name. Why does Jesus call them apostles and not prophets? Um, one of the reasons we think is probably the case is the Greek word prophetes, which is the word we have for prophet, held a myriad of meanings in the New Testament world. Um, there were lots of groups that had prophets, and they all served slightly different ways depending on the religion that you were talking about. In Titus 1.12, for example, Paul writing to Titus, says <clears throat> one of the Cretans from Crete, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Same word, prophetes. Certainly not the kind of prophet of the Old Testament, right? So I like that definition. Telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind, I think is a helpful one. Um, so if that's the case, if prophets in the New Testament are not the same thing as prophets in the Old Testament, then let me take one thing off the board from the beginning. It means that if someone comes to you to give you a prophetic word, and they begin with, God wants you to know this, God is saying to you this, then you reject it. Because they are placing themselves in a line of authority that they do not have at all. This is my primary problem with, and I, 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 uh, I, I taught on this from the stage last year, I wrote a blog about it, uh, with the devotional Jesus Calling. Um, I don't think that the material itself is bad. I think it's actually mostly really pretty uplifting stuff. My general problem with it is that she claims that Jesus wrote the words through her pen. Who is it? I can't think of her name. Sarah Young. Sarah Young. Sarah Young. <laughs> and so, and not to go into Jesus Calling rant, I, I, I read the blog and, and I explain my, my thoughts on that, but that's, that's the basis for why. Um, I don't believe that we have that kind of authority to say that. There are some major problems with that. <clears throat> yeah. Now, um, well, we'll get to the practicality of it here in a minute, because I think you're going to find out that prophecy actually works out in ways that you may have even practiced at the end of this. Um, so just follow me. We've got about 15 minutes. I think we can do this. Um, let me give you some indica indications that prophets in the New Testament did not speak with the authority equal to the words of Scripture or God himself. Just so that you can see that what I'm saying isn't just me making stuff up. Acts 21.4, um, there is a disciple in Tyr, the city of Tyr, and it says in verse 4, through the Spirit they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Through the Spirit, 
don't go to Jerusalem. And what did Paul do? He went to Jerusalem. (laughs) So it would be very incongruent with Paul's character for him to hear the direct words that are equal to God or Scripture and then just flatly disobey them. But to make the point even further, the next chapter in Acts 21, we have uh, Agabus, 21, 10, and 11. Uh, Agabus is an actual, it, sa- it says he's actually a prophet. Um, what did I say? 21, what? 10 and 11? That's right. Um, <clears throat> While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is very similar to Thus says the Lord. But that's really probably, once again, not the best interpretation or uh, translation of this. It's just saying the Holy Spirit is saying. Okay, it's, it's kind of a common vernacular. Now, what he says at first glance seems to actually be true. Paul goes to Jerusalem and some things unfold and he ends up in Roman custody. So we might look at this and go, Agabus was right. He was a prophet and he, everything stacked up. But it really didn't. Acts 23, when you read the account, Agabus says, um, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns his belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Um, he's actually not bound by the Jews there at all. He is brought before the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he, it's kind of it's shady and awesome. I love it. Um, uh, he is brought forth, and Paul knows that they're Pharisees and Sadducees, and he's like, brothers, I was a Pharisee. And uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying is true of the resurrection of the dead. Well, Sadducees reject resurrection of the dead because they reject all of the Old Testament with the exception of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The first five books of the Bible don't have any explicit parts about uh, resurrection. Now, we talked about this, that Jesus actually rebukes one of the Sadducees and sort of makes the case that it does, but it's not explicit. And it starts a fight between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They start arguing, and the Pharisees are like, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. He's pretty cool to me. And the Sadducees are like, no, he's a Pharisee. And they they go kind of crazy. And in order to protect Paul from being destroyed by the mob, they put him in a cell overnight until things calm down. They're actually helping him. But then we get down to the next part. It says there were Jews who were waiting, who had conspired, about 40 of them, to murder Paul. And they said they took a vow not to eat food until they kill Paul. Paul's sister's son hears about it, which is just weird. Paul had a sister, Pauline. And, um, <laughs> and she sends her son to tell the Roman cohort what had been going on. And they send 200 soldiers to come and protect Paul as they take him to Roman custody for him to appeal to Rome. So it is not that the Jews bind him and set him, the Jews wanted to kill him. It was Paul who brought Rome into the picture to bring him before Rome himself. So here's what my best take on this is that Agabus had a vision of some of these things that were going on. I think that this was something the Spirit put, and vision or something, some, something from the Spirit was telling him, Paul, you are going to be bound by Jews and Gentiles are going to take you into custody. I don't think he was saying like, do this as a command from the Lord or don't do this as a command from the Lord because once again, Paul went anyway. He didn't, adv- he didn't take the advice of Agabus. Um, and Agabus even goes on, and it says, if you keep reading, um, where is it, 21, um, then Paul answered, uh, let's see here, yeah, when we heard, look at verse 12, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be in prison, but even die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we seized and said, let the, the will of the Lord be done. So this, it's... You understand that if these prophets were speaking on behalf of God, it makes no sense for them, for him to say, no, I'm not going to do that, and then for them to just go, okay, well, let the Lord's will be done then. There was a give and a take here. So uh, it's not that they are, are perfectly on point, because they're not claiming to be perfectly on point. They're receiving something from the Spirit, and they're imparting that to them, with no expectation that this is even the full picture or the exactly accurate picture, or maybe it doesn't happen at all, right? There is, there's a give and a take that happens here. This is why when we read Paul's letters, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 21, 
Paul says, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. So if someone comes to you and says, I feel like, you know, God is, is wanting me to say to you, I feel like, you know, or I, I don't know why, but I just feel led to tell you that, that, you know, this, that you don't just immediately go, whoa, I'm not charismatic, hold on, right? But that you listen and that you examine what is being said and hold fast to that which is good. Um, this is how it works out practically. When the Spirit brings someone to mind to pray for during a group prayer. If you've ever been in a group prayer, like in a life group or a Bible study, and everyone is praying, and it's kind of like, hey, we'll start with you, I'll close, anyone who wants to pray in between, feel, feel led. And it's like God puts it, puts it on your heart to pray for someone. I believe that's, that is an example of, of how prophecy might work in the context of a prayer. God is putting something on your heart that you are saying. Um, when a, uh, a song or a hymn comes to mind for a specific setting, you know, that, I think that there is absolutely, like for Kelsey, as Kelsey, our worship pastor, has come to James and I every week and like, hey, what are, what's the text this week? What are you doing? Because he's praying and, and asking God, you know, to show me a song, something that might minister to the people in this context. He's not saying, God has told me <laughs> that on this day we are to sing this. That's not what he's saying, but it's just, it's, it's a... It's a gentle nudge, you know. Uh, uh, what is it? What did Roddy Chong, I loved his, his, the violinist when we had him come. He called it a deep convicting thought. I think that's, that's great. I really like that. Um, when you feel compelled to share something with someone, right? Just something. Like, I don't know why God's, t you know, if, if this is from the Lord or not, but I just feel really led to share this with you. Um, it is not a proclamation of God,